correct in the citizen comment section on JER 2.4, uh, please enter your name and address into the chat. Hi, sorry I'm late. We're just getting started, thank you. Okay. All right, it looks like we've uh, stabilized with our attendees uh, jumping into the meeting. Welcome to all of our attendees and our board, and thank you for taking the time to be with us tonight. I'm Lynn Feeney Hatton, I'm the superintendent, and we're gonna go ahead and get started with our operations committee meeting. Um, before we get started, I do invite you to add your name and address in the chat. If you'd like to make a comment during citizens comments uh, 2.4, Mr. Taylor would then recognize um, you when it's your turn to comment. And at this point, I'll turn the meeting over uh, to Mr. Gatanis. Thank you, Lynn. Um, welcome everybody to the January operations committee meeting. And before we get started, I have to read a statement here, uh, get this out of the way. Pursuant to board policy 1B5, all meetings of the Salisbury Township School District are audio meetings and for any statements made by these in attendance. Um, so uh, that being said, uh, can we uh, have a roll call, Mr. Taylor? Yes, Mr. DeFrank. Here. Ms. Frick. Here. Mr. Gatanis. Here. Ms. Glenister. Here. Mr. Ganahl. Here. Mr. Hattinger. Here. Ms. Klinger. Here. Ms. Nemitz. Here. Ms. Ziegler. Here. And we have a quorum. Okay, thank you. That takes us to uh, item 2.1, tax collector compensation discussion, Mr. Taylor. Okay. Uh, you'll see in this agenda, and you also see it on the agenda for the regular board meeting tonight, uh, a resolution to adopt for the setting the compensation for the tax collector. And I just wanted to give a little bit of a quick background about this so that everybody's aware of what we're voting on tonight. Uh, this is an election year. Uh, 2021 is an election year for uh, town board, uh, school board members, but it's also an election year for the tax collector for the municipality. And the state <laughs> requires us, uh, based on a General Assembly Act from 1945, to set the tax collector compensation prior to the election. And we have to do it by the 15th of February of that year. Uh, and then that compensation would stay, according to that resolution, throughout the term of the of that tax collector which is a four-year term uh, that's just so that uh people can't change the compensation whether they liked or disliked the the outcome of the election you said it before the term what we are recommending and what we have in the resolution is keeping the compensation the same as has been for the prior uh term which is twenty five thousand five hundred twenty two dollars and fifty cents per year i did check with the township and they said that they were not uh, contemplating making any changes to their compensation. The township also compensates $10,000 a year for the, for the collection of the township taxes. So the tax collector gets uh, just over $35,000 a year between the school district and the township. Uh, so it's just a formality of approving it. Like I said, it must be done before the 15th of February. That's why we have it on tonight's meeting. Does anybody have any questions regarding the resolution or uh, the fact that it stays 25,522 all four years? No. All right. So that one is nice, short, and sweet. Uh, with that, then uh, we can move on to the uh, presentation of the uh, first look of the preliminary budget for 21 22. And I will share my screen. And <clears throat> put that up there. Okay, can everybody see the presentation? Yes. All right. So this year, uh, the we're a month behind compared to last year. Last year, we did stuff in December because we had to adopt a preliminary budget earlier due to the presidential election. Because uh, all the timing of the preliminary budget uh, is uh, based off of when the primary is in the state of Pennsylvania. Because 
use a preliminary budget to see if you need to apply for any exceptions to the Act 1 index. Then the school district can apply for the exceptions. And then if we are denied exceptions or if we still needed to increase taxes beyond that, then you can put a referendum uh, on the uh, budget uh, on the uh, up for vote during the uh, primaries. So it's all based off of when the primary is when you have to have your preliminary budget and that whole process. So last year we had to have it in December, the start of it. This year we can do it in January due to the timing of the uh, primaries. So we'll go over, like you, you're probably getting a little familiar with this setup from last year and the year before. Uh, this will start with the timeline. And tonight we are presenting the first look of the preliminary budget. And this first look is based off of trend analysis. So it's not really dug in really much line by line as much as really uh, a trend analysis of the expenditures over the last five years. Uh, and our revenues are, as we'll get into them, really are more based off of what we know for sure right now. Obviously, the state budget hasn't been released. We don't know if there's going to be any increases. So we have a more conservative approach with our revenues. Uh, tonight, we also uh, are adopting the uh, tax collector compensation, which is required this year because of the election. February 17th, at the school board meeting, uh, we would be adopting the preliminary budget. The deadline is the, the 17th, so it's, uh, it's right there at the, at the deadline. February 22nd would be when we are required to uh, submit the tax increase to PDE that was adopted by the preliminary budget. February 25th is the deadline to publish notice of intent to file for exceptions to the Act 1 index, which we've done the last couple of years. Uh, actually, February 25th is when we will, uh, yes, and then uh, the deadline to seek the approval of the exceptions is March 4th. So we have to publish notice first by the 25th of February, and then we have to submit them by the uh, March 4th. March 24th is the date that uh, the Department of Ed is supposed to rule on the request for exceptions. Then May 12th is the date of, right now we're proposing for the adoption of the proposed final budget. May 27th is the deadline for the proposed final budget to be available for review if we're gonna adopt the budget on June 16th. So that's the uh, remaining timeline for this budget process. For the preliminary budget revenues, the assumptions are uh, the value of one mil uh, for the real estate taxes is $1,318,920 as of the valuations from December 7th, which is the most current numbers we have. Uh, local revenues uh, reduction of the taxable assessed value so the taxable assessed value has gone down 646,900 since last year's adopted budget. And that's through uh, assessment appeals and, and, and other things of the sort. State revenues, uh, right now we are not budgeting any increases to subsidies except for PEASERS and FICA because those do change with our expenditures. But right now we don't have any uh, knowledge of any increases to basic ed subsidies or special ed subsidies. We have to wait and see what the uh, governor's uh, budget presentation is on that. And along those same lines, right now we're not projecting any federal uh, revenue increases as well. For expenditures, the things we've factored in so far is salaries and benefits. What we did is we actually took our current positions and factored in any uh, expected increases, either step, column movement, experience, uh, based on current contracts and agreements. And we put in there projections for those salaries, uh, along with the uh, benefits that uh, go along with those, the, the cost of the PEASERS, FICA, the expected increase in healthcare and dental costs. Uh, and then we've done trend analysis for the tuition, uh, for the transportation costs, uh, special ed and charter and cyber charter schools. As we get further along in the process, we will try to nail down those numbers more finite, but right now it's based off of a trend analysis over the last five years. Some of the more of the assumptions, uh, salaries, uh, just a reminder, last year, all uh, staff took a salary freeze for the 2021 school year. Uh, this year, professional staff increases are following the step in column movement per their contract. Support staff increases, this is the first year of their new agreement, and they will follow the Act 1 index per the contract. And the Act 1 index for this year will be 3.0%. So that is what the increases are based off of. Administrator increases are 
uh, put in the uh, pr uh, preliminary budget based off of Act 93 agreements and specific contracts. As far as PEASERS, that has been a cost that uh, the board and everybody's been well aware of for years has been increasing. It is still very high. Next year it'll be 34.94% of all salary dollars compared to 34.51 in the current year. Uh, so the actual growth rate though has slowed to one and a quarter percent. So it's still going up, but it's, uh, it's not growing as fast as it was, which that leads me to believe that we're not likely to be eligible for exceptions for PEASERS growth. Um, the two exceptions that we usually are eligible for would be PEASERS and special ed. But what it is, is it's the growth beyond the Act 1 index. So with the Act 1 index being 3% and the growth rate of PEASERS only being one and a quarter, we're not likely to qualify for that but we would likely still qualify for special ed. Right now for health insurance, we are budgeting a 10% increase. That is the number that the consortium has gone with so far for their first looks and what the IU and uh, L-TRI-C has uh, uh, budgeted for their uh, healthcare increases. Uh, there's been a number of years where we had gone lower and we've used uh, the rate stabilization fund to not have such large increases. Last year it was four and a quarter, but the year before that we had a 0% increase. So this is Kind of catching us up to us now and, and we're bunching a 10% increase this year for all members of the consortium. The allowable millage rate increase for this upcoming school year, the current millage rate is 20.5106. A 3% increase on that would allow us to raise the millage rate by 0.6153, which would give us a total allowable millage from the Act 1 index of 21.1259. Based off our, our value of a mill, we would get 1,318,920 for each one of those mills. That increase would allow us to increase our uh, real estate tax revenue by $770,955. And, and just as a reminder, the millage rate is, uh, the, the, uh, the assessed values are a little bit lower this year than last year. So the value of the mill is listed there. Our preliminary budget showing expenditures of $39,148,240. To achieve that, we would have to have a millage rate of 22.1110, which would be an increase of 1.6004 mills or an increase of 7.8%. That rate does exceed the Act 1 index, which would make us eligible to apply for exceptions. And just a reminder, with this first preliminary budget, what we do is we go, uh, you know, a little bit more on the high end for the expenditures and reduce them as we get more finite numbers. And like I said earlier, with our revenues, we are not projecting increases in state and federal until we get better numbers. So that, that gap will naturally close just by going through some of the budget process, but there still would be uh, some reductions that we would need to make to close that gap. So the allowable increases there, uh, like we saw before about the available exceptions, which would be special education and PEASERS. We do not have the calculation yet for the special education to calculate what that would be. Uh, but based off of prior year's experience, we're probably looking somewhere between a half million and three quarters of a million dollars potentially uh, for uh, special ed exceptions. So this is the chart just showing, uh, if we see currently the Act 1 index would allow the millage rate to increase by this much. Here's the current millage rate. If we do no tax increase based off of our current millage rate and assessed values and our other uh, projected revenues at this point, our revenues would be $37,842,942, which would leave a gap, uh, a deficit of just over $2 million. If we take the Act 1 index increases, it would then bring our revenues up to $38,613,897, which leaves us currently with a deficit of $1.2 million. We don't have the exceptions figured in yet, but once we have that, we would be able to add that to the column and reduce our budget gap even more depending on what those exceptions are. So right now, if we go with the Act 1 index increases, the median assessed valued residential property, which is 176,400, would see a property tax increase currently of $108.54. All these calculations in the deficit is based off of uh, a collection rate of 95%.
in prior in, in some prior years, we've used as high as 96%, but with the economy and everything, the projections of the collection rates for uh, uh, real estate taxes, we were going with a 95%. So if we see things improving a little bit, we could possibly nudge that up a little bit more to 96 or 97%, which would then also affect the gap and, and reduce that a little bit more. So at this point, the administration's recommendation would be in February to adopt a preliminary budget with the preliminary expenditures of $39,848,240 with the revenues based off of going to the Act 1 index of $38,613,897 which would leave us with that budget deficit of 1.2 million. Issues still to be resolved with this preliminary budget would be the state budget, which is uh, unknown at this time. Uh, looking back in some of the discussions we've had with, uh, in, in, the biz, in, in, the, uh, in the business services area with other school districts is just, is this gonna follow trends from the last recession of 2007, 2008 where the federal government did give some uh, additional funds, ERA funds to help with the economy, but really what it did is it offset some of the state revenues that they were reducing. So while there may be some additional federal aid or some additional grants from the state government, we are just hoping to see that that's additional to what they were giving and that doesn't reduce any basic ed subsidies or special ed subsidies. So until we get some more cl uh, clarity on that, uh, we aren't really projecting any increases. Uh, tax assessment adjustments, uh, as the board's aware of some of the tax assessment appeals that have gone out there, um, waiting to see, you know, what it comes to fruition with some of those. Uh, at this point, we don't know anything about any re employee retirements. It's a little too early to know about that and how that'll affect the budget. And then just the, uh, the IU special uh, education services, charter school enrollments. And then as we continue to work with departments on their needs and where they can make any potential cuts or savings, uh, obviously, this year has been very different. So there might be some resources that they have that they didn't expend that they might be able to use for next year. So that'll take some time to really uh, flush that out as well. And then just continuing to implement the five-year forecast and see how some of these things and uh, some of the debt restructurings, how that affects our five-year forecast, that all still remains to be uh, resolved through the process over the next few months. So that's the first quick look at the uh, preliminary budget for next year. Does the board have any questions? regarding that? One thing, uh, Mike, if you could explain to the public, I'm not, uh, just to make sure they understand when you talk about 35% for piecers, they, uh, in a nutshell, uh, that just basically means whatever your total payroll budget is, 35% of that has to get added to take care of their retirement plan. Is that pretty much it in a nutshell? Absolutely. And uh, and then actually, I'll, let me give you a number real quick. Let me pull up something that I was working on earlier. Let's see. Give me one second while I pull up this number for you. Um, while Mike finds that, are there any other questions? The only question I just wanted clarified, uh, Mike or Lynn, the $646,900 for tax assessment uh, reduction of revenue, that's all because of recent tax assessment appeals? So that would be for uh, any changes in assessments from last year, uh, June's budget to now. So that could be properties that are either condemned, uh, properties that have come off the tax rolls for various purposes. That would also be um, assessment challenges. Uh, yes, uh, but that, that's primarily where it come from is assessment appeals. But these are known, these aren't like uh, anticipated or maybe like these are known numbers, we've lost this revenue. Those are ones that have already been uh, adjusted. Absolutely, yep. Thank you. Yeah, so just a, a quick look at the, the numbers. Our salary lines are a little bit over $14 million. So when you're talking about a 35%, like George said, you're looking at uh, you know almost $5 million added 
to your cost in just the, the Peasers pension contributions. So that's that's why it's a burden. And if we look back, and I'm, and I'm looking at the history, if you just go back 10 years ago, we were contributing 5.64%. So that's that's how dramatic it's, it's skyrocketed over the years. And that's why it's been such a challenge for school districts and put, really put a constraint on the budgets for for school districts is, is the rapid growth of it. Because as you see, our Act 1 index will grow anywhere between one and a half and 3% usually. Uh, and the average has been 2.6 over the last 10 years. So when you have PCERS jumping from just over 5% to up to 35% in a 10 year period, that's been a very challenge to, to the budgets of the school districts over the last 10 years. Mike, just curious that, that number of reduction, does that include any bad debt or is that a separate line that we calculate? That is purely, uh, that reduction is purely on um, their assessment. Okay. okay. So yeah, that's, and that really the, the bad debt or people not paying, that's more factored in that last slide where I was showing the collection rate that we're factoring in a collection rate of 95%. Okay. Okay. So that's where you accumulate for the down economy and everything, the 95%, that's where you bury bad debt. Correct. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. I want to just make sure we're accounting for it because it's not the greatest of times out there and I'm sure we'll anticipate and, and have some of that. Thank you. You're welcome. Mike, following up on that, um, Sam's question, the 95% that you're figuring on in the past, what does history show that number, the actual number ending up? Is it like 96, 97? How does it generally end up actual collections? Sure. Uh, most years, uh, by December 31st, when the tax collector is done collecting here locally, usually we're up into about the 97% range. Um, and then when we turn stuff over to our, our collection agency, by the end of the year, usually we're up to maybe 98% in most years. Uh, depending on the year, it can ebb and flow. But looking back to 2007, 2008, we were down uh, for a year or two down into the 95 to 96% range. And that's why we're going with that number. Uh, I would feel I'd feel pretty optimistic of getting 96 to 96 and a half. Uh, but usually we start a little bit more conservative. Last year we started at 96 percent, um, and the year before that we started at 96 percent, but we ended up I think 97 or 98 for our budget. But last year we started at 96 and went back down to 95 just because of the economy. And looking back, what happened in 2007 and 2008. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any questions? Any other questions from Mike? Okay, thank you, Mike. You're welcome. All right, I'm gonna make another attempt at something here. I don't wanna admit what actually happened to me here because of my technological ineptness, but I'm gonna reread that statement I made earlier. I had printer problems, so I'm gonna read that again, bear with me. Pursuant to board policy 1B5, all meetings of the Salisbury Township School District are audio and video recorded. The district disclaims any and all liability arising from the recording of the meetings and for any statements made by these in attendance. Main governing board. Um, that makes a little bit more sense treating it that way, but thank you. Um, okay, any other uh, questions or comments or issues from the board? Okay, seeing none, that takes us to citizen comments. Uh, Mr. Taylor, do we have anybody in line? Nobody has signed up in the chat for comments at this meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay, our next meeting is Wednesday, February 3rd. And with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, those in favor, aye. 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 Okay, thank you everybody. Uh, do we just stick around um, on this Zoom? Yes. Okay. Does everybody need a moment? Or are we ready to roll right into uh, the board meeting? I'm good to go. Let's roll. Okay. Okay, um, so we'll start first of, uh, do you wanna start off Lynn or do you want me to start the meeting? Sure, just a, a quick reminder for any of our uh, citizens, our guests tonight, if you'd like to make a comment during the um, comment section for citizens, please add your name and address into the chat. Um, so the first comment section or the second comment section. Thank you. Okay. 
I hope I don't have to read this again, do I? <laughs> I will make it official. Right okay. Uh, all right. Pursuant to board policy 1B5, all meetings at the Sazerbrae Township School District are audio and video recorded. The district disclaims any and all liability arising from the recording of the meetings and or any statements made by those in attendance. Okay. With that, uh, let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Taylor, can we have a roll call, please? Yes. Uh, Mr. DeFrank. Here. Ms. Frick. Do we have Ms. Frick? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Oh, okay, there we go. All right, Mr. Katanis. Here. Ms. Glenister. Here. Mr. Ganahl. Here. Mr. Hattinger. Here. Ms. Klinger. Here. Ms. Nemnitz. Here. Ms. Ziegler. Here. And we have a quorum. Okay, thank you. That takes us to student representatives report. Okay, well, we're gonna be starting with the high school and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing these names, please correct me, but is it Janita Johnson and Sierra Rausch from Salisbury High School? Correct me if I'm incorrect. Janita Johnson. Okay, thank you. So I'll start out. I'm gonna do like a little bit of an update. To start, we have sports. So JV and varsity boys basketball are playing tonight at Brandywine. Um, wrestling has a match tonight as well. They're home. And girls basketball gets in action tomorrow versus executive at the high school. And it's our senior night. We are excited that the end of the semester is coming up. It is on Friday the 22nd because we're changing schedules for the first time. So um, the semester actually makes everyone change their schedule. And that's never happened at the high school. We always just change our elective courses. Um, we are excited to return and theater has a production called Winter Break by Joe Calarco. It is available on video on demand Friday, January 29th and Saturday, January 30th. Tickets are $15 per household. And if you have any questions, contact the Office of Student Activities for more information. Um, there's not many events for clubs as of right now, but once we get back in school, things will start showing up but we do have Powder Puff. We just planned that today, actually. It's gonna be March 3rd. So that's our annual, um, when girls play football, we play flag football and the boy football players coach us. So that's exciting. And then we have an appreciation letter as well. Okay, so I will be reading that. So good, good evening, valued members of the school board. During these unusual times, we would like to say thank you. Thank you for all that you do for Salisbury Township School District as members of the school board. Your progressive leadership and judgment are valued qualities and are very much appreciated by us. We understand that this past year has not been easy on anybody, especially those who are deeply involved in any high stake decisions making. We are grateful for your guidance and looking forward to seeing, seeing your leadership and decisions pay off for us in the future. Please accept our gift as a token of our appreciation for your service to the students, faculty, and staff of the district, along with its community members. Each one of you will receive your own succulent that will hopefully grow as much as all of us will. Even during these trying times, you have to cultivate the community that, will, that we are proud to be a part of and represent. Unfortunately, due to the complicated situation, they will be shipped at a further time, and we will let you know how we would get, get you them soon. We appreciate your patience and understanding. Thank you for leading this school district, its faculty, staff, students, and community in the right direction. We have nothing but hope and optimism that you will continue to lead us to achieve and reach our highest potential. We are very much looking forward to what is ahead of us. We wish you all the best going forward and much less stressful year ahead. With gratitude, SHS Student Government Advisory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Yeah. Rauch, and thank you, Ms. Johnson. Um, 
So God, uh, we have to thank your parents too, because we wouldn't be able to do what we do without them. So make sure that con you convey that to them when you get home. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. And thank you, Ms. Roush. Now uh, we that takes us to Salisbury Middle School and Meredith, but Meredith Kelly will be speaking and for uh, support she has, again, uh, straightened me out if I say it incorrectly, but Cheyenne Cordes, Gwyn DeFazio, and Amani Solomon will be, are there for support. So whenever you're ready, Kelly, Miss Kelly. Hi, everyone. I'm actually going to start them off. They're going to be speaking uh, momentarily. But um, first, I'll introduce myself, Kara Bellis from uh, Salisbury Middle School. And I'm also here with my student council co-advisor Meredith Castagna. And um, I'm not really sure how we're supposed to follow up Sierra and Janita. They did lovely. And um, it's, it's nice to see you ladies grow. So thank you for that. But we also, from the middle school, uh, have a token of our appreciation because it is uh, School Board Appreciation Month. And we were trying to think of something practical given the pandemic that we are living in. So we thought um, soap would be perfect. And we just have a little tag that goes with it. So it says, hands down, uh, you're the best school board member around. And those will be uh, being delivered to you shortly as well. Um, and like was already stated, I do have some student council members here, eighth graders, Amani Suleiman and um, Cheyenne Cortez and seventh graders, Gwen DeFazio and Meredith Kelly. And at this time, I will turn it over to uh, Meredith to speak a little bit. Hi everyone. It has been a year of uncertainty for Salisbury with many obstacles from the closing of school to coronavirus and virtual learning. However, one constant during those times was you, our school board. We know that throughout every bump, you are there to truly guide what is best for Salisbury and its learners, no matter how hard that may be. We thank you for your ever constant support and time in serving our district. Thank you again on behalf of Salisbury Middle School and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. The gifts aren't necessary, but they're much appreciated. Thank you. OK, that takes us to uh, any changes or additions to the agenda. Seeing none, that takes us to, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. A second. Okay, mm -hmm. those in favor say aye. aye. Or any aye. Aye. I'm sorry, any questions or comments before we vote? Okay, seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Ayes have it. George, okay. you skipped 1.4. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, I did. Uh, special recognitions and presentations. All right, so first of all, um, thank you to our learners from Salisbury Middle School and Salisbury High School, as well as Mrs. Bellis uh, from the middle school and Mrs. Castagna for recognizing our board members um, during our school director recognition month, um, it, which happens every January. So some of you may not know, there are 500 districts in Pennsylvania and each district has nine board members. So 4,500 board members across the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, locally, elected to four-year terms. Um, and all of our board members serve as volunteers, no pay for these um, long meetings and difficult decisions and opportunities to hear and impact the lives of our learners, our, our school community. So we thank you for your um, participation, for your service to our, our school community. And we're very appreciative of the time and energy that you give to all of us. So thank you this January uh, during our school director's recognition month. And thanks to all the learners who spoke tonight. It's, um, it's not, that's not an easy task. So thanks for being here and you're welcome to stay for the meeting. You're also welcome to, to drop off of the meeting as we move on to the, the next portion. Um, the second special recognition tonight that we have is a retirement and I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Sawicki at the middle school for that recognition. 
Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm here today to recognize Steve Hilaire. Uh, Did Mr. Hilaire opportunity... come back? I hope he, he came. I was looking, you know, I was looking for him and I couldn't find him and I was switching between okay. pages. I'm, I'm hoping that he's here. Okay, he did. He was here, and we told him we would be about twenty minutes, and he was going to pop back on. So if he's not here, then we will just um, we'll wait till he comes back on, if that's okay yeah. with you, Mr. Gatanis, and yeah. move on. Absolutely. Okay. He's not on the list of panelists at this time. Okay. So how about if we move on, um, Mr. Gatanis, to the next uh, section, and then we'll come back when Mr. Hilaire returns to the meeting. Okay, that takes us to 1.7 then, citizens inquiries and comments pertaining to the agenda items. Do we have anybody, Mr. Taylor? Yes, we have one currently signed up and that's Laura McKelvey. Okay. And let me uh, make her active. All right, Mrs. McKelvey, you should be able to speak. Uh, good evening, school board. I'm Laura McKelvey, and I live at 1780 33rd Street Southwest. And I wanted to comment on two personnel items on tonight's agenda. First, I'm very glad to see that Matt Ritter has been rehired. When COVID shutdowns occurred last March, he was very helpful and professional in his responsibilities and was really essential for getting our family what we needed for Lucas. I'm glad he's back as part of the Salisbury staff and believe SES is better for having him there. Second, I wanted to comment on the retirement resolution concerning Diane Walbert. Miss Diane has been Lucas's IA for the past few years and I am sorry she's found herself with no choice but retirement. Mm. I cannot express how much I and my family value her. She loves Lucas like her own grandchild and treats him with the respect and dignity he deserves. When the ball was dropped repeatedly over the years in his learning support classroom at WSE, she picked it up and ran with it. She went above and beyond using her own personal time to develop appropriate curricular materials for him and researching best practices for kids like him. His success at school is a result of many, many people working hard, but she was definitely the one who was the most vital to his growth. He will miss her and so will I. Thank you so much, Miss Diane, for taking such good care of my kid. He's a better person because of you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I, before we move on to somebody else, I see Mr. Hilaire is here. Can we, um, can we honor him at this point? Yes, George, and there was no other public comment. Okay, great. All right, so we'll turn it back over to Mr. Sawicki. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm here today to recognize Steve Hilaire. I had the opportunity to uh, be one of his teammates for a couple of years on the eighth grade team. Um, so today we wanted to recognize Steve for his 27 years of service. So with that being said, I am going to now read the resolution uh, recognizing Steve for his service at Salisbury Township. So whereas Mr. Hilaire has completed over 27 years of distinguished service as a science teacher at Salisbury Middle School from 1993 to 2000. 21, and whereas Mr. Hilaire created a positive learning environment and promoted student achievement by fostering a classroom community within the school where he taught. And whereas Mr. Hilaire saw the potential in students and worked to help each other achieve, each student achieve his or her best. And whereas Mr. Hilaire understood the meaning of community and supported the staff members at Salisbury Middle School. And whereas Mr. Hilaire went above and beyond his job description, spending many hours coaching varsity girls basketball, junior varsity girls basketball and softball, middle school girls basketball and softball, middle school boys basketball, and serving as a class and yearbook advisor. And whereas Mr. Hilaire leaves the teaching profession knowing that he provided insight, expertise, knowledge, professionalism, care for others, a passion for connecting with students, and a passion for science, therefore be it resolved that the Board of School Directors of the Salisbury Township District tenders Mr. Hilaire the sincere thanks and appreciation of the board for his untiring efforts on behalf of our public schools and for his devoted and successful labors in the cause of public education and be it resolved further that this resolution be made a permanent part of the record of this public meeting, January 13th, 2021. Thank you, Steve. Congratulations and happy retirement. Thank you. I'm enjoying 
Congratulations. Congratulations. It feels good. <laughs> You're looking great, Steve. Yeah, nice and relaxed. I was just watching the the uh, JV basketball game. They won that. Now the varsity game's on. So thank you and uh, good luck. Congratulations, Mr. Congratulations. Take care. Congratulations, Congratulations Steve. Steve. See you around. Be well. I hope. <laughs> okay. Uh, that takes us to a motion to approve the following minutes. And that would be uh, the reorganization meeting on December 2nd and the regular board meeting on December 2nd. Do I have a motion? So moved. A second? Any questions or comments? Seeing none. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you. That takes us to payment of bills. We have um, general fund expenditure. We have uh, uh, nutritional services, and we have the uh, bond proceed funds that uh, have to be approved. So do I have a motion on, on approving them? So move. So move. Second. 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 Okay. Any questions concerning these? Seeing none. Those in, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Ayes have it. That, uh, we have no treasurer report today. Um, and that takes us to the report of the secretary of the board, Mr. Taylor. Uh, I'll keep it brief. Uh, we talked about it before, but we did uh, go over the preliminary budget first look in the operations committee meeting with the act one index being 3%. And the other news that became official just recently is the PEASERS rate has been set for next year. PEASERS is the pension plan that we have to contribute for each dollar of salary we spend. And it is gonna be 34.94% for uh, fiscal year 21-22. And that is my report for tonight. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Okay, uh, that takes us to uh, our committee representatives and uh, Ms. the curriculum and te technology committee, uh, Mrs. Klinger. Okay, hello everyone. Um, we have not had a curriculum meeting since October 26th, except for last week, the special board meeting that was held, I guess that was basically curriculum because I was the only one who had any motions to make. So. We had the special board meeting last week where we discussed and voted on uh, the return to school and tr tr transitioning back in. And tentatively now K K1 is coming back January 26th. And the remainder of the district second to 12th grade will be back in person or, or totally virtual uh, on February 8th. Um, under the curriculum, I have four items to move, 2.1 to 2.4. 2.1 is we're, we're the affiliation with Slippery Rock University uh, School of Nursing Program, School Nursing Program. And 2.2 is approval of a student from Slippery Rock uh, doing their practicum in the fall of 21 with our school nurses, Chris Tripp and Lynn Welliver. And 2.3 is an agreement with uh, uh, CLIU 20 for psychiatric evaluation services um, through the end of the year. And 2.4 is approval of a special ed agreement and release for student A. So with that, I'd like to move items 2.1 to 2.4. Does... Okay. Do I have a second? I'll second them. Okay. Any questions for Carol on any of those line items? Okay, seeing none. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Ayes have it. Thank you, Mrs. Klinger. Welcome. Okay, that takes us to operations committee. It's been a while since we've had a meeting 
it was about 15 minutes ago. Um, but um, we went over uh, the tax collector compensation resolution, which uh, has to take place every time uh, there's an election, uh, tax stipulation, which includes some um, uh, reassessments that affect us. And uh, 3.3 is the per capita taxes that uh, we get notified whenever there are any changes with that. Um, as far as uh, our next meeting goes, it will be February 3rd. And um, with that, I'd like to move item 3.1 through 3.3 for approval. I second that. Okay, thank you, Carol. Uh, those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, and any no's? Not seeing any no's, so uh, that gets approved. Thank you, everybody. That takes us to the personnel committee, uh, Mrs. Ziegler. Thank you. I have a, quite a few items tonight on the list. These items include the retirement resolution, um, that we had heard about a little earlier for Diane Walbert. We have a revised substitute rates for 2021. We have a few uh, resignations um, from different job families. We have uh, employment um, for some substitutes, uh, a long-term substitute teacher, some uh, building um, substitute positions. We have a uh, induction program mentor. We have some FMLA uh, staff returning from their FMLAs. We also have requests for FMLAs and sabbatical leaves. And we also have coach employment, a volunteer coach. And we, as always, we always have a change in our substitute addition and deletions list. So for your approval tonight, I'd like to move 4.1 through 4.28. I'll second that. Thank you. Okay, any questions for Mary on any of those line items? Okay, seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, ayes have it. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Ziegler. That takes us to the policy committee. Mrs. Frick, do we have anything to go over? No, we have new policies, no new policies at this time to review. Okay, thank you. All right, in student activities, I would assume our students took care of that. Mr. Ganahl? You are correct, Mr. Gutanis. Okay, thank you. Okay, that takes us to reports. Um, uh, CLIU, Mrs. Ziegler. Thank you. Prior to me moving the one item, I'll share um, from our December meeting of uh, December the 21st, we did have an update on the behavioral health program. Um, it has been extended, funding has um, been found or uh, generated outside of the IU all the programs will continue for behavioral health at this time. The school-based program was always gonna continue. It was the non-school-based programs. In addition, the IU has approved a nursing supervisor. Um, they are now up to having uh, eight nurses with the hope of increasing the number of nurses um, in the near future, which will uh, help the districts that are in need of nursing. This is no additional cost to the districts. This is paid out through access funds. Um, it's also uh, involving um, school districts, the on-site uh, classrooms for the IU, and also the inter intervention uh, early program. And um, it will help because there's a lot of different agency contracts 
and this supervisor will help um, maintain what this staff will now look like. That was it. Uh, my next meeting is um, on January 25th, I believe. Yes, 25th. So um, the only item I have for you to uh, approve tonight is 7.2, which is the general operating budget, which I had shared um, the information last month. There uh, is no change to it. There's a decrease in fact for Salisbury and superintendents have already um, reviewed and given their okay for this budget. Okay, is that all, Mrs. Ziegler? That's it, just to move for approval for 7.2. Okay, all right, do I have a motion to move that 7.2, the general operation budget, budget for CLIU 21? So moved. A second. Second. Okay. second. All right, any questions for Mary concerning that? Okay, seeing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, ayes have it. Thank you, Mrs. Ziegler. That takes us to the Lehigh Carbon Community College, Mr. DeFrank. Yes, I, I have one item myself, 7.4 to move. But before that, I had a board meeting on uh, January the 7th. Uh, it was a very exciting meeting. We were discussing uh, a program that is forthcoming at El Tri C that I'm not at liberty to discuss publicly, but it will be announced soon. And I think it will definitely uh, put that campus and, and, and that program into a different category. And see how diligently they're working to expand uh, that, that campus and, and what it does for the entire community. And I think it'll be a real feather in their cap. And I'm hoping uh, by my next meeting on the 18th, uh, some public also be forthcoming. And again, share more details. I don't like being so clandestine, but uh, pretty much I've been edited of what I can and can't say at this point in time. Uh, in regards to the budget, I think it's a very responsible one. There's over a $2 million reduction, mostly in capital expenditures. There's over 1.5 million increased revenues. There is level funding to districts. Uh, there is uh, increasing of grants, but the school has come out and found a $450,000 uh, for the school. And there is, which I think is the, the greatest achievement at all, there is equivalent level funding of election credits that are being taken at the school to maintain and address their budget, which in this day and age of universities having drastic reductions in both attendance and credits, it's a testament to how hard they work to both retain and add students to this program and move forward with that. And it has been a total team effort. They are, I can't say enough good things about that group out there as they continue to be a jewel just like El Tri. C is uh, for the Valley and an asset for all. So with that, uh, I so move 7.4, uh, the L Tri C budget. Okay, thank you, Mr. DeFrank. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Okay, any questions for Mr. DeFrank concerning this line item? Okay, seeing none. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. DeFrank. Okay, that takes us to Lehigh Career and Technical Institute, Mrs. Nemitz. Um, I have no report tonight. I missed most of our December meeting because of a personal obligation, but um, our January meeting is coming up sometime in the next two weeks. So I will have more info for you next month. Okay, great. Thank you, Mrs. Nemitz. Okay, um, that takes us to uh, PSBA Legislative Policy Council, uh, Mrs. Frick, do you have anything that you'd like to uh, present to us? Uh, George, this month, Becky Glenister has joined me on the Policy Council, and uh, she did some research, and she's ready to give a, a report. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Mrs. Glenister, the floor is yours. The computer is yours. Right. So, yes, yeah, so PSBA is the Pennsylvania School Board Association, and um, as I did a little research into what they're talking about, they put out a, a survey, a 2020 State of the Education survey. And for the first time in the four year history of that survey, charter school tuition is now the biggest budget pressure for districts, which has overtaken pension costs as the most commonly identified budget pressure for the public school district, which I don't think surprises any of us. We talk about that here on a regular basis. 
Uh, so they talk about, you know, they're big on trying to advocate for charter school reform. Um, their other main advocacy concerns right now are um, focusing on a fair, predictable, and equitable funding formula that provides districts with the greatest flexibility to use their resources. They're trying to address Pennsylvania's pen pension funding crisis, also not a surprise. They're um, talking about uh, providing for the, I think this is a very important one. It's one of their top issues, providing for the safety and mental health needs of students. So they're trying to provide schools with a permanent funding stream and assistance for such purposes, as well as flexible options that best meet the needs of their students and communities, which is something obviously it's been a long-term concern and even more so now during, during this pandemic, I think. Um, the, the pandemic itself, another point I was looking at that they were talking about dealing with is the pandemic has highlighted cracks in the um, truancy laws that they're facing. So many districts are reporting an increase in unexplained absences, which could lead to truancy troubles for thousands of students impacted by factors ranging from homelessness to lack of home internet access. And this creates a concern not only for the well being of those students not regularly attending school, either virtually or in person, but since school funding in many states is tied in part to daily attendance, this is raising concerns among education leaders that missing students might impact budgets once the state flexibility expires. So it's all sort of interwoven together. Um, and the, the last one they talk about is actually internet access because of so many students being virtual. They're saying many students are having difficulty obtaining access to reliable internet service and local districts are trying to piecemeal solutions to solve a problem that highlights an access gap that has existed all along, which is just yet another deficiency being underscored during this pandemic. So a lot of students that don't have reliable internet, whose parents don't have it at home, who are, you know, again, they talk about the homeless situation. It's just sort of, I think the pandemic has sort of lifted the, the veil on a lot of problems that have already existed and they're just becoming even more um, emphasized. Okay. Thank you very Thank you. much, Mrs. Glenister. Okay, that takes us to solicitor's report. Mrs. Roddick, do you have anything you'd like to offer? I do not, other than it's always a pleasure to be here. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for being here. Okay, that takes us to 7.8 leadership team report by Mrs. Lynn Feeney Hetton. Yeah, All right, so I do have a, a quick slideshow here that I will uh, share with the board. Um, just a, a brief update. <clears throat> Let me go ahead and screen share. Okay, so as you know, we're working diligently to transition to the face-to-face -face model, and Mrs. Klinger gave us a brief update on that. Um, last week, we did share some staffing concerns. Uh, once the dates were put out, we did ask staff to um, inform us of potential requests for leaves or accommodations. Um, and I have some updated information to share with you tonight. We asked staff to inform us by this Friday so that we can um, make plans and try to um, address those challenges. So looking first at the elementary school, all the way at the bottom is uh, current anticipated under the blue, that's what's current for today. Uh, the one six, that's what I showed you last week, um, just to try to share the most current information. Of the biggest concern here is the unfilled instructional assistance. Instructional assistance serve in a variety of roles, um, directly supporting our learners, one-to-one uh, -one assistance, uh, support some of our special education students. We also have instructional assistants working in intervention positions. Sometimes instructional assistants cover um, a lunch duty or arrival or dismissal. Um, these positions are critical to our functioning in our buildings. Um, so that is concerning the eight unfilled instructional assistant positions. Uh, we are working diligently um, to try to reach out to Maybe there are college students who are home who are interested in working. We're going to look to be flexible with hours and, and days. We've also reached out to local colleges uh, for um, students who are in the teacher prep program that they might be interested. It's a great way for those students to, to garner some experience. Um, so we're working on filling those uh, positions and uh, wanted to keep you updated. 
At Salisbury Middle School there, again, in the blue, you can see um, the concerns that we have at this time. And again, these are anticipated. There are staff members who may not have submitted paperwork yet. Um, this is our, our best sort of uh, guess based on what we know right now. Again, instructional assistance is a concern. And then finally, here is the high school staff. These are our anticipated uh, vacancies as well for professional staff and instructional assistants. Um, so this, this is um, a concerning. The instructional assistance is what's of most concern here in the district at this time. Um, we are looking at some medical concerns for staff and are we able to provide some accommodations um, based on ADA? So uh, our coordinator of HR, um, Mrs. Tara Mossman, is working diligently with principals to see uh, what we can do and how we can uh, best fill those positions. If you remember, these are the concerns that I shared, the implications. This was what was shared last week. I want to just give you some updates on, on these. Um, number two there, we expressed a need to hire some additional building substitutes. You've seen that on the board agenda tonight. Uh, Mrs. Mossman has been working with our building leaders to secure um, two to three building substitutes in each building. So that will help with um, unexpected absences or um, potential instructional assistant needs, um, you know, last minute coverage. It just provides us with a couple of more people who can assist in making sure our students are supervised and that we're able to provide the instruction. In number three there, our building leaders are working um, to create coverage opportunities. So uh, Ms. Morningstar, and Mr. Mushlitz, as well as Mr. Parliament and Mr. Sawicki, um, primarily those spaces, we would see those, we anticipate seeing those at the high school and middle school level uh, when coverage is needed. Just wanna remind our families and our community and you as board members that we may need to shift to fully remote due to staff quarantines or classroom coverage. Um, we need to have supervision for our learners in our, in our buildings. Also number five, looking at potential programmatic changes if we're not able to offer some courses. Right now, based on um, the number of instructional assistants that were short at the elementary, we may need to shift some instructional assistants into one-to-one -one positions, and that may impact some of the other offerings and opportunities for learners within the building. And then finally, if we um, are not able to staff the full day, we may need to look at shortening uh, the face-to-face -face day for our learners. So those are all items that we shared last week, and just giving you a little bit of update to um, you know, let you know that we're working to address all of these challenges. Okay. Any question on that? I do have one more thing, uh, Mr. Gatanis. Any questions on that before I move on? The no. other piece, the other piece that I want to remind you as board members, this is something that Mrs. Frick asked last week um, that I gave you a very quick overview, but I want to make sure that our community understands uh, these closure recommendations by the state. We are agreeing to these recommendations um, in what we complete as an attestation form based on the fact that we are um, bringing some learners into the building in substantial when the state recommends against it. We are agreeing to several things, including having um, you know the six feet, the mitigation practices, as well as the closure. So I just want to quickly show you um, what that means and how we'll be following it. The state puts out guidance and it's linked in the in the presentation, but that guidance shows you based on the size of the school and the number of students in the school, how many students, it, how many cases of COVID you would have and what your implications are. So if we have five students or staff in the same building in a small school building under 500 students, we would be clean, we would be looking to close the school up to 14 days. And the state says the closures are for mitigation, therefore cleaning, therefore um, disinfecting, contact tracing, investigations. Um, and again, that's if those cases happen within a 14-day rolling period. So you would have, if you have five cases within 14 days, we're likely closing the school to contact trace, clean, 
And then once we reopen, it starts again at zero. And I want families to understand that we are agreeing to do that. And, um, you know, there, there could be an impact or sort of a surprise, like we're at four cases. Please know if we have one more case reported, this is, this is the path that we're going to be going um, in the interest of transparency for our families. In the interest of transparency to help you better understand where we are, we created a COVID dashboard. Um, thanks to Mrs. Bishop, who works in our office and um, Mrs. Pauling for giving some information here. We are just launching this and we'll send this out to community members, but there are two pieces of information here that are important. Um, one at the bottom here, these are historic cases. These are the number of cases that we have, students and staff that we've reported since um, the beginning of the school year. Those are our historic cases. The active cases within the last 14 days, these are the cases that affect the potential closure. So families should be able to look at this and say, oh, you're getting close, or okay, we have no cases. It's not a foolproof because we could have four cases in a day. We could have you know, zero cases for 10 days and then get five cases, but at least it helps you better understand um, as family members, as community members, and even our staff, like where we are in the case count. Um, Lynn, Lynn, one question. Uh, is this count going to be for both uh, students and uh, administrators, faculty, yeah. everybody, correct? Mm -hmm. The Just active cases. People in the, building. Yep, the state does not um, discern between staff and students. Everybody is included in the cases. And it's not only um, positive cases, it's also if the physician says that you are um, a probable case. So you know, we haven't, we haven't reported any probable cases to our community members because we haven't had any probable cases. Um, but there are physicians who are saying, okay, you don't need to get tested, but you're a probable case based on these factors. Those cases are also reported in the active cases by building. Can you, can you Thank tell you. me, I'm sorry, tell what, what's the requirement for reporting a case and now that we're gonna be bringing staff and students back into the building? So we are, we are expecting parents to report cases to us. Um, we are expecting staff members to report cases to us. It's our understanding that we should also hear that case from the, um, we may also hear that case from the Department of Health, but it's, we are hoping that families are open and honest when they have a case. And we've, it's our understanding that that's been what's happening. Families uh, reach out and share their information and concerns so that we can communicate with the larger school community. But there's no no requirement that they report. We we won't we wouldn't know if they didn't report if the health department doesn't report it to us. Okay. And I have no reason to to believe that people are not reporting cases. Um, you know, we've we've people have talked with our school nurses, employees have have talked with our HR or their building leaders. So the purpose of that update was just to quickly show you the dashboard as well as um, what we would do to respond to cases and give you an update on the staffing. Lynn, how do we get, um, where's, where's the dashboard located? I will send that out. Um, I wanted to share it here first and then we'll share it out in a community update. It is on the website under the COVID page. Okay. Lynn, can it be added to the app also? I'm not sure, but I can check um, with Chris Smith, who okay. has a better understanding of what the capabilities are. If it's capable, if the app is capable, um, you know, we can add it. <laughs> that would be great. App, yeah, if the app does not permit it, then we wouldn't be able to add it. Okay, thank you. Lynn, how is how's the community going to be notified, like if there's a last minute closure of a school, the same type way with snow days or... Uh, they, they would have to constantly be watching, you know, like, you know, a snowstorm is coming and you know, look out for it, but uh, um, how would they be notified? They will be notified through the same system, the um, AppDG Thrill Share system. Okay. And also, you know, it's important to also say they're also notified when a case occurs. So families receive information on the case, um, you know, I've forwarded that information to the board members. So you know if you've gotten a couple of emails that you you may be getting close to that number. 
Okay, any other questions for Lynn? Okay, thank you, Lynn. You're welcome. Okay, any new business from the board? Okay, seeing none. That takes us to citizens inquiries and comments. Uh, Mr. Taylor, do we have anybody? We do not have anybody signed up. Okay, thank you. Okay, that takes us to um, upcoming meetings. So um, we have a curriculum meeting on Monday, January 25th. That will be via Zoom. Uh, we have an operations meeting on February 3rd at seven o'clock via Zoom. We have an executive session the 17th of February at 6.30, and we have a regular board meeting Wednesday the 17th at 7.30. So with that, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. Those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Ayes have it. So have a good night, everybody, and thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Take care, Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.